and he liked um, hearing what other people had written. He always wanted to hear uh, your most recent song. He was always asking uh, of the people, the songwriter and musician friends that came to his house, you know, what what do you got? What's your newest yeah. song? He always wanted to hear somebody's newest song. And uh, that's great. You know, he wouldn't just blow smoke at people about well, he literally would blow smoke in your face from his <laughs> your bed, but, uh, figuratively. Figuratively. Yeah, figuratively. <laughs> Welcome to the Lone Star Play Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Join me and a famous guest. We discuss their career, life, food, Texas, and everything in between. Let's get started. The Lone Star Play podcast is produced by TexasRealFood.com. Find out more at the end of this episode. Hi, guys, and welcome to another episode of the Lone Star Play podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. We have a wonderful episode today. Great documentary that's out right now. It's called Without Getting Killed or Caught. You can check it out on the website without getting killed or caught.com. We'll put a link in the description. You say, Patrick, what's that about? That sounds a little familiar. Where have I heard that phrase before? Well, those are lyrics from a song called LA Freeway by a great musician called Guy Clark. That's right. Texas's own Guy Clark. And there's a film which basically it's about the dynamic of Guy Clark, um, his wife, Susanna Clark, and Towns Van Zandt. Okay. And people say Guy Clark and Towns Van Zandt are like the greatest songwriters ever, right? You've heard that before. And basically, it's just about their rise from obscurity to reverence, right? And just the journey that they sort of, the dynamic that those three had. Um, it focuses on Guy, but through the lens of Susanna and Towns, there's diary entries and recorded conversations and interviews and stuff um, from all the different, you know, friends and different people in their orbit. It's a wonderful film. Um, I had the producer and director on, um, Tamara Saviano and Paul Whitfield. Um, both wonderful in their own rights, okay? Writers and artists and, you know, coming together to their, their husband and wife team, and they put this film together um, based on Tamara's book that she had of the same name, Without Getting Killed or Caught. And again, it's a great film. I got a screener to watch it. It's a phenomenal film. I absolutely loved it. Um, I've gone down the rabbit hole of their music, and it's a great rabbit hole to go down. So please, check out the film. You can rent it exclusively on the website, okay? It's not on any streaming. And we talk about why they did that, too. It very much parallels, like, the music industry and and Guy Clark's and Towns, um, you know, rise to to be on a big label. It's sort of the same process for them. Let's just say they released the film on an independent label. Let's let's think of it that way. So again, you can watch the film at the website on the website without getting killed or caught.com. We'll put a link in the description. That's the only place you can see it. You can rent it for one day or three days. So um again, we really break down sort of the documentary, what it was like putting it together, how it came together. Sissy Spacek is a narrator. Uh, well, she, she speaks for Susanna Clark in the film. Um, it, it's, you know, we talk about that a little bit about Guy and Towns and just them as songwriters, them as people, um, what they hope to get out, you know, get out of the film and what they hope you get out of the film and, you know, everything else that comes with it, of course. And we talk a little bit about food, find some great stuff. There's actually some really interesting stuff about Guy Clark that you're going to find out, um, in this, just in this interview that I did not know. So if you're a Guy Clark fan, if you're a Towns Van Zandt fan, Susanna Clark fan, this is the podcast for you, and this also is the film for you. So without further ado, let's jump into the interview uh, real quick. Before we do, a quick word from our sponsor, Texas Real Food, because as always, we got to keep the mics on, y'all. So we'll be right back. Hi, I'm here to tell you about TexasRealFood.com. It's a great website where you can find local farm fresh food in Texas. Just enter your zip code, okay? It'll bring up Texas farms and ranches, farmers markets, farm to table restaurants, and more that are around you. It's really easy to use. Also, if you think there's a business that should be on the list that isn't on there, let us know. We'll get them added. 
as well as being able to enter your zip code and find all the great places around you. We also have great recipes, cooking techniques. You can learn about food and Texas food specifically um, and local food events that are happening in Texas. So it's a great website aside from that. And it also features, of course, the Lone Star Plate podcast that it produces. Um, we've also got some other features as well, like Food for Thought, Fresh from the Kitchen, Tasting Texas, the Texas Mom Blog, Real Food, Promptuary, a lot of great resources about Texas, all things Texas, focusing on Texas farmers and ranches and, you know, real food, y'all. Okay, so anyway, please go to TexasRealFood.com right now and begin your Texas journey for great food. All right, back to the show. All right, guys, thank you so much for sticking with us. Let's just jump into this interview before we do real quick, our social media. That's right, we have social media, y'all. Please follow us online on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Just search The Lone Star Plate. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button and, and the notification bell because we release a lot of new videos. You can be notified when those new videos come out, okay? And if you're watching, this really helps hit the like button. That would really help uh, as well. So, uh, and leave a comment. What's your favorite Guy Clark uh, song? Towns Van Zandt song, Susanna Clark song. Um, you know, let us know in the description or excuse me, in the comments and why. Or a great story. Maybe you saw them. You had an interaction with them. That'd be really cool because we, we got a, this great video um, uh, clip from um, a Stephen Tobolowsky interview about Stevie Ray Vaughan. And, and, and basically the comments is like over 500 comments in that video. Check that out. Uh, it's a great clip. Uh, and everyone's just throwing their own stories and this and that. It's a great little community. So I know there's Guy Clark community out there and Towns Van Zandt community, right? Let's Let's get the stories and start building it down in this um, episode as well on, on this uh, YouTube video. So, all right, guys, without further ado, thank you again so much for watching. Uh, let's jump into this interview again with Tamara Saviano and Paul Whitfield. They produced and directed this great, wonderful film without getting killed or caught. Um, it's about Guy Clark, Susanna Clark, and Towns Van Zandt. All right, let's jump into it. Enjoy, y'all. So, well, anyway, listen, thank you all so much for, for taking the time to, um, to join us today. I had the absolute pleasure to watch y'all's film um, w without getting killed or caught. I just want to make sure I said that right, because they are lyrics. So people are like lyric, lyricists, diehard lyricists, right? Like, so I want to make sure I get that right. Um, phenomenal film. Um, to be honest, I'm was kind of in a dry spell of listening to guy clark and stuff and like this just that's all i've been listening to it's just yeah. been of, of all of them right of just everybody just branches out it's like a tree all of a sudden you just start oh well this song and that guy and this and that i mean god it's an explosion of um uh creativity and artistry and um you know uh reverence as as y'all used one of the words a rise from obscurity to reverence um and it's basically right this film just follows the story of guy clark susanna clark and um towns van zandt yeah i, I mean it's it's primarily about guy but you can't yeah. tell a story about guy without telling some of the story of susanna and towns because they were the three of them were so linked in yeah. so many ways Absolutely. I mean, when you watch the film, it's um, absolutely. I mean, there's just so many, some of the more intimate parts are some of um, Susanna's stuff, right? Where some of her diary entries, some of those things are very just personal. I think that's more, more of the personal moments, I guess, is, is what I'll say. Um, yeah, it's a great, um, great documentary. Um, how did y'all, I guess just an easy question here, just a softball, like how did this sort of project um, come together this this uh, this film you want to take well this? <laughs> I'd never heard of Guy Clark <laughs> before I met Tamara and she was she's the world's biggest Guy Clark fan so uh it just sort of happened that she was it you know all things Guy Clark so uh when she she started writing a book about Guy and somehow that evolved into a documentary and uh, maybe you can elaborate. Yeah, so Guy um, Guy and I were working on the book about him for um, eight years. We were pretty much joined at the hip working on that book. And 
And that was quite a difficult project and I was feeling overwhelmed and I had missed several deadlines. And, and during that time, a filmmaker approached Guy about doing a documentary and frankly, Guy just did not want to start over with someone else. And so he told me that if there was going to be a documentary, I had to do it. Um, and oh, wow. Yeah, I was kind of like, what? And, yeah. and so I asked Paul, who is also my husband um, and a video guy and, and really smart and gets that world, you know, that filmmaking world. I asked him if he would do it with me. And um, he said, yes, I don't know. He might be regretting that now, but <laughs> <laughs> but here we are. <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt it. It's a wonderful film um, for sure. I'm sure putting it together was, I'm sure at times trying. Right. Uh, but but overall, um, the end product is uh, so many people get to enjoy. So we, we all get the uh, fruits of your labor, I guess. Uh, is- well, <laughs> we didn't really have a plan when we started. Yeah. We just wow. Knew that we we wanted to get we wanted to interview Guy on camera. Uh, and so we just we had a, a thought in our mind. We talked about uh, documentaries that we liked and styles that we liked and techniques that we liked. And so we went and we were just going to interview Guy on camera. And so we really didn't know what we the final product was going to be. And so it evolved quite a bit from that first day we went to his house to interview him on camera, which was basically just sort of the uh, a recap of the interviews that Tamara had already done for the book. And, but then, you know, we were like, OK, well, how do we make a how do we make a story out of this? How do we you know, tell, how do we condense it all down? And so it, it evolved quite a bit through several, we made the movie probably four different times, <laughs> you know, over the course of the, yeah. of the project. Like testing recipes, right? Just finding the right one that works. Yeah. We had, yeah. A, we had a few false starts and, we did. you know, restarts and everything. So it all came together when uh, my co-writer, Bart Nags, he and I took a, um, screenwriting workshop in Austin um, taught by uh, Jill Chamberlain. She wrote a great book called The Nutshell Technique and Bart and I took her workshop. And that's when Bart came up with the idea of telling the story from Susanna's perspective. And the minute he said it, I knew it was a brilliant idea. And then I called Paul and told him and he said, yes, that's perfect. And so then Bart and I wrote like the beat sheet and the basic script during that workshop that was in the winter of 2017. And that's when our storyline really, really came together. Yeah. We had gone, we had gone a a back and forth about how we were going to tell the story and whether we were going to have a narrator or not. And we didn't really like the idea of having a narrator because who would it be, you know, would it, but, but when, when we decided to have Susanna as the narrator, because we wanted to incorporate her more in for her to have a presence in the film, yeah. And uh, that just made it all come together after that. See, these workshops do work, right? Oh, do, yeah. You know they... what? I'm a big fan of workshops. When I wrote my book, um, there's a, an author and a cartoonist, Linda Berry, and I went to several of her workshops in Chicago and Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, without her, I never would have written the book. So, you know, workshops are a great place for you to really. Um, dig deep into whatever creative project you're working on. And I, and I'm a big believer in them. Did you guys find yourself, I'm sure as you're p- piecing this together, right? You said you had really no idea how to get, you know, how to start it, how to piece together the story. Did you find yourself finding new things out about these people as you're doing this, as you're piecing the story together, sort of as, as somebody even just watching the film, right? Learn some, maybe some new things about um, these people. Did you find yourself in sort of the same discovery process? Well, I already knew a lot because I've written a 450 page book um, yeah. and spent, you know, eight years with Guy going through all of his stuff. However, when we started listening to Susanna's tapes uh, and basically they were her audio diaries and reading Susanna's written diaries, which I did do during the book process, but I had not listened to the tapes. And yes, uh. those tapes were gold and you hear some of them in, in the film. And so I learned new things from Susanna's diaries. Yes. Hey, see, there you go. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great. It was, um, it was all new to me. Every time I discovered something, I would 
I'd say, hey, Tamara, look what I, and oh, yeah. yeah. yeah that's, uh, <laughs> knows that. Oh, that old story? What are you talking about? That's funny. Um, okay, so people right now can watch the film on the website, right? Uh, without getting killed or caught dot com. You can rent it for one day or three day, which honestly, I love this model. Um, honestly, to, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. So we, you know, Guy has a built in fan base and we had several discussions with traditional film distributors along the way. And quite frankly, all of those deals were so horrible. I would rather nobody ever see the film than sign one of those deals. And so I talked uh -huh. to the team and was just like, you know what, let's just take this to our people because we have, we know the people that want to see this film. Let's just take yeah. it directly to them and cut out the middleman. So we did. Um, Very we Guy Clark thing to do. Yes. Yes, right. <laughs> we, we debuted at uh, South by Southwest virtual in 2021. And then we did like a series of virtual um, screenings where you had to show up at a certain time and have a ticket. And we had, you know, interviews with some people. And then we did a theater tour um, from July through October. And then on Guy's 80th birthday, November 6th, we launched it on demand. And that's where it'll stay. So if anybody wants to see the film, they can just go and watch the film at their leisure. And that's that's the only way that they're going to be able to see the film. Um, and we kind of like that, that it's like yeah. in, it's in our community, you know, yeah. and we get to control the uh, artistic vision. There's not someone that's going to tell us, oh, you have to change your poster or you have to edit the film here. Or, you know, it can just be our our creation and live as we wanted it to. So that's important it. to us. I love, you know, there's actually, I'm going to kind of jump around just because you said that, because uh, there was a quote in the film that stuck out to me, um, cursed with our, uh, with artistic <laughs> integrity. Is that, is that it? Are y'all cursed? Is uh, it a we, curse? We, it, it doesn't feel like a curse to me. I, um, I've done several creative projects and I've done it both with, other you know like record labels and on my own and it's always more satisfying to do it my way <laughs> so, absolutely if yeah, just I, everybody I would realize that it was best to do it her way then <laughs> yes yes that's funny <laughs> yeah i mean we you know we uh yeah i mean you get, when you get a distributor involved um all they're looking at is the bottom line that's all they care about is how to make the most money and and i would like us to recoup the money on our film that would be really nice if that happened but I also don't want to sacrifice the film for that. And, and I have in the past sacrificed projects for the, you know, for the distributor and it's not worth sure. it to me. Sure. It's such a parallel to the film itself. Um, yeah. Standing up for this and, you know, um, believing in this and, and just, I, I just that, that whole quote about uh, cursed with, you know, cause is it, you know, ignorance is bliss when it comes to artistry. Is that the best way? Is it, um, I guess some people feel differently about it if it pains them or if it's feel like it, they have to go through these hurdles every day, you know, to maintain it. I don't know. Um, well, I think it know. depends on what you want. You know, I mean, there are people that go to offices up and down music row every day and write songs together for the radio and they're commercially successful and they make money and that's awesome. And I'm glad yeah. for them. And that's what they want to do. And that's terrific. That was not Guy. A uh, Guy did write songs with people and he loved it, but he was doing it for the process, for the art. Um, and he never, you know, wherever they ended up landing, he always said, well, that's none of my business. You know, I just want to <laughs> keep doing what I do. So, you know, and I think, you know, there's always, if you want people to see your art or hear your art or whatever, there's going to be a, you know, there's commerce involved because if you're just making your art and you don't care if the world sees it, then you're a hobbyist. But if you want to be a professional artist, you have to think about the commerce. But the good news is, is today there's so many different ways to do that. Um, there are not the kind of gatekeepers that there used to be. Um, and if you make good art, you, you hope it'll stand out. So, uh, 
you know, there's so so many different people have a, had their own idea of what a Guy Clark documentary should be. And, you know, we heard lots of suggestions and they're all valid. They're all good stories. I mean, we could have made uh, 10 different Guy Clark films, but, you know, this is the one that we decided to make. This was the story the way, the, that we wanted to tell and the way that we decided we wanted to tell it. And I think maybe the only... Uh, the only thing that we did compromise on was Tamara insisted that it be 90 minutes long. <laughs> and so we did have to only, I mean, only 90 minutes. Long. Okay. Yeah. I was going to ask. Yeah. That's, okay. that's <laughs> where, uh, we, we did have to compromise. Yeah. And cause, uh, if, if we had kept going, it, it would have been, you know, much longer, but, uh, for commerce sake, I guess commerce sake. Well, that we did we did sacrifice the art to ninety minutes. It well, came out at ninety five. So yeah. Well, yeah, that yeah. and I am in the camp That's that funny. I believe you want to leave people wanting more. I I really think that's important that when somebody you know finishes watching the film they want more and so they go look up Guy Clark and they start listening to all Guy Clark stories and they you know yeah. that's what I think to me. that's really important because if you sometimes you know less is more and if you do too much you get people going oh, is this when is this going to be over you know it's kind of like going oh. to a concert especially where, nowadays right. Yeah, they do. They might, you know, come out for an encore and do six more songs. And it's like, that's not an encore. That's just extending this concert, you know? Um, I mean, I, I just really think that pacing and that leaving people wanting more is, is important, you know? So. Cause there, there's uh yeah, there's 10 more movies of Guy Clark stories out Waiting there to be made. Yeah. Just, yeah. I just see. couldn't. We can't fit them. And maybe all someone in. else will go make those, and that's fine. You know. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. There you go. Just inspiring a, a series. There'll be something like get that get back thing on on the Beatles. Did oh, y'all yeah. see that? What did y'all think of that? We have documentary. Watched it yet. Oh, gonna, you really? We're gonna watch it over Christmas. That's our plan. So. I mean, it's long. It is. It's you know, it is long. It's an I'm investment of time. To yeah, it's an investment of time, but well worth it. I absolutely enjoyed it for sure. Um, you know, I, as I'm watching the film, I'm thinking, you know, did y'all have to like have an idea as you're building this, you know, film? Did you have to have an idea of who they are and sort of build the film to that? Or were you building it and, you know, seeing who they are as it builds? I don't know. Does that make sense what I'm asking? The characters, you mean? Yes, yes. Uh, you I, know, the, the, you know, Guy and, and Towns and Susanna. I think that we knew who they were, you know, there might've been some learning along the way, but we had a pretty solid grasp of who they were to each other and who they were to the world. Um, and the fact that Susanna's voice was lost in the greater world until now. And that was important to me too, that Susanna was such an important part of, you know, the singer songwriter scene in, in that era. And people talked about guy in towns, towns and guy, guy in towns. And, and it's like, kind of like, well, yeah. what about Susanna? She was yeah, yeah. really important. So, um, so I'm, I'm happy that we were able to bring Susanna's voice up front and to have Sissy Spacek uh, be Susanna's voice in our film. That was pretty amazing too. Absolutely. Yes, for sure. What, what, how was that getting her? Well, you know, it's one of those things, and I always believe this as a creator, that if doors just keep swinging open for you, that it's meant to be. And um, I just had this epiphany that I think Susanna sent me from the great beyond one day that Sissy needed to be our Susanna. And I started to do research on Sissy and found out that she grew up uh, 100 miles away from Susanna in Texas. And... Um, she, after she won her Oscar for Coal Miner's Daughter, she came to Nashville to record an album. Rodney Crowell produced that album. I called Rodney about it and he said, not only did I produce that album, there's a Susanna Clark song on that album. Oh, so, wow. you know, Sissy just, it was meant to be. And, uh, yeah. and Rodney made sure that she, you know, uh, responded to us. Rod Rodney asked her to, you know, to take a look at it. So, um, without him, we probably would not have gotten sissy, but, uh, 
were really thrilled. And then we went into the studio with her and it was just magical. You know, she just became Susanna. That was probably the easiest part of making the whole film was yeah. her uh -huh. uh, narration and working with her in the studio. And once we put, put it into the film, it just really uh, came to life. And it was, it was a great process. Was it, uh, you know, everything was sort of cut together and she was sort of watching it and, and, you know, narrating over that, or did she do her narration y'all made some cuts to that or? Well, we, we had uh, a little bit of both. pretty much, you know, cut the whole film and we had a temporary narration in place. And so when she came into the Got studio, it. we, we had it all written out, but then, you know, we would make changes on the fly if it, if it felt better for her or she thought it, you know, it was easy, it would make more sense to say it a different way. And so we would make a few changes, but it was pretty much, you know, it, it was, it was a finished film when she came in and uh, yeah. So we just did it in, in one day in the studio. Oh, wow. She, she one just, day, really? She just knocked it out from top to bottom. Wow. You know? Yeah. We were surprised. We had booked the studio for two wow. days. Yeah. And had it kind of on hold for day three. And she sure. just, she just made it look easy and just, you know. you know, we start and we started late. We started at like 11 a.m. and we were out <laughs> there before five. I mean, it wasn't and even a full day. She's like, she's like, I got this. Yeah. I got we, this. I got <laughs> she had done some research. I mean, she saw the film and, and then she and Tamara talked about who Susanna was and what Susanna's motivation was and, and different things yeah, about the, who, you know, trying to, uh, get into who Susanna was. And then when we came into the studio, we were set up, you know, so that she could do it like watching the film or whatever, but it, it, we didn't end up doing it that way. She just, uh, you know, we just pretty much worked from a script and she, she performed each little piece and we just let it roll. We just let the, the recorder roll all day and just captured what she was doing. And then, uh cut it into the film she's yeah, she, yeah. she's obviously a total pro and yeah, of course you know, it was yeah it was great what do you want people to get um out of this film when they watch it is it just besides just you know going down a deep dive of their music and finding out well, is there something specific from the film that y'all made i would hope that they would un they would see the importance of strong women in guy's life and you know in his upbringing and then later in life you know they would see that that he was influenced by a lot of strong women his uh his grandmother his mother his guitar teacher then susanna and the and it's reflected in the the characters in his uh, the songs that he he's written and you know so hopefully people get that out of the film. I think that's was one of the things that we were trying to portray, you know, without actually beating people over the head with it, but just sure. sort of, uh, throw that out there, show these, his life and the, and the effect that women had strong women had in his life. And I also think that it's really a story of friendship, certainly the friendship between Guy and Towns and Susanna, but also with all the other people, people in their orbit, you know, Rodney Crowell and Steve Earle and Terry and Joe Harvey Allen and Barry Poffs, who was the founder of Sugar Hill Records and Verlin, who was on the road with Guy. I mean, Guy influenced so many people, you know, me and Paul, I mean, his influence is so deep and broad and, um, and I really think there's so many strong friendships and relationships that came out of knowing Guy. Um, and friendship was important to Guy. You know, you think about his song, Old Friends. Um, that was, in, in my mind, that was a big theme in his life. He surrounded himself with other creative people and people that got him. And uh, we see that in our music community, and and I think that's really important. The you know friendship is is an important uh, part of life, and and I hope that that's reflected in our film. Absolutely, you know that sounds so different from like something Guy Clark would have said about this film. Because uh, if you ask him, there's a part of the film where he gets asked like, 
what do you want people to remember you by or so, something along those lines and he says i'm a great songwriter you know yeah. and i i find that actually fascinating that both y'all's answers had nothing to do with his songs and that's the impact that art can have it can sort of transcend the medium that you used to get people a message or whatever and i think that is shows what a great songwriter he is is that his message or his life stood even taller than you know his music and his songs yeah it did but i do hope everybody goes down the guy clock rabbit hole. of course of course <laughs> i mean that's a given they're they're uh, i mean you know they're they're some of the most beautiful songs i mean they really are i i definitely see why people say you know you that's part of the the conversation of greatest songwriters right Th yeah. those two guys are in it susanna should be in there as well um it's a it's a weird thing of how do you decide who's a great songwriter? How, how does that? I think that's I mean, a personal, yeah, personal decision. You know, it's it's music is really personal to all of us. And and over these years, I've been living in Guy Clark world now every day for thirteen years. And and over <laughs> this time, um, I've come to know a lot of Guy Clark fans. We have a Facebook group that has almost thirteen thousand of them, and we all have the this emotional connection to the music and that's really powerful it can it connects people you know and you know it's kind of like if you go to a concert and no matter who's on the stage everybody that's there is there for that same reason and you're all in this moment together uh even though you don't know each other you can feel the power of that moment that you share at that concert and you know it's it's a really strong personal connection i think yeah absolutely what do you think paul you got any ideas well, of what, what you think makes a good songwriter well or uh well guy clark he was a he was a, com a complex human he was a real person he wasn't just a songwriting machine that you know took elements and cranked out music you know there was this whole person a whole life that uh, contributed to his songwriting. And, you know, I'm not the, the, the expert Guy Clark musicologist. Most of what I know ha came from just my interactions with him since I met him in what the, probably 2000, late 2000s, I, I yeah, I discovered Guy, but I knew him as a person not through his songwriting and not through his records or his performances. I just knew him as, you know, a person that I would see from time to time. And uh, that wanted to take you out to eat meat. Yeah. He always <laughs> wanted to take well, Paul out. For barbecue. Dinner. Yes. Oh, steak. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, he liked all kinds of food, <laughs> you know, food yeah. was very important to him. So uh, very important. And Love he that. was an old school man of the world. And old school men of the world go out for steak dinners. So that's what. <laughs> was that's that his favorite thing? Steak, obviously steak, but you said he's a man of food. So I'm sure, was he very adventurous with just always wanting to go try different things? Uh, I don't he know knows. that he wanted to try different things, but he wanted to eat. That's he, for sure. Yeah. He loved barbecue, <laughs> but not pork. Mexican food, you know, Texas cooking, whatever, you know. Yeah, and he sure. had a sweet tooth. Bigger than any sweet tooth of anybody I've ever met. Junk food. <laughs> uh, he liked to eat, and he took a lot of joy in eating. And it was it was fun to eat with him. I love people like that because I love to eat myself. I love to go out and break bread, and uh, yeah, those, those are some of the best moments. Um, so, so yeah, that's. We unfortunately never had the steak dinner, but we did have. Uh, we did go to one of his favorite restaurants near his house, and we both had the meat plate. So. <laughs> Close enough. Yeah. Cl close to the meat plate. I love it. Is that what it was called? The meat yeah. plate. I'll take I the meat plate. The meat plate. Yeah, it was just a plate of all the meats that they had. <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah. On the menu, you could get the plate of all meat. And at the other end of the table were a couple of vegans. So <laughs> yeah. that was a very, you know. Yeah, we were out to dinner with Guy and uh, Brennan Lee and Noel McKay. I don't know if you know them. They're friends of Guy's, musicians. And they are vegan. So, uh, and I'm, I tend to, I'm not a vegetarian, but I tend to eat more that way. So yeah, it was yeah. awesome. And then Paul and Guy were eating the meat plate. And it was fun. You're like, do you just have the plate? I'll just take that. Just, <laughs> yeah. that, that's what we'll have. That's funny.
<laughs> That's great. Um, so, okay. So we've talked about why you think people should watch this film, what you think they should get out of it. Um, I, I guess sort of a big question would be like, more than just Guy Clark or even Towns or, or anybody that's songwriting, their desire to, you know, want to be able to kind of go back to this thing of commerce, right? Like you want to make money off of your art, like you want to keep doing it, right? So you got to sort of like pick and choose your battles. What do you do? You know what? And it sort of touches on it a little bit in the film of like, why do you think, I mean, we can just start with Guy. Why do you think he didn't make it big? You know, I guess there's a lot of different, you know, lanes you could take with this, but what, whatever y'all think here. Well, one of the things is, you know, and we talk about this in the film, when he had the record deals with the major labels with RCA and Warner Brothers, you know, they were trying to fit the square peg of Guy Clark into the round hole of commercial country music. And I love commercial country music, you know, give, sure. I mean, I've been listening to country music a long time, but Guy is a folk singer. Guy is not a country music guy. And so it just never worked. And Guy, I think he wanted it to work, but he wanted his music to stay the way it was and translate. And the labels were like, you know, this yeah. is not going to work on the radio. So it just, it was just a mismatch. And as soon as Guy kind of gave that up and said, and said to himself, this is not working. And he went, you know, to Sugar Hill Records with Barry Poss, who said, you do the art and I'll figure out how to sell it. That's a whole That's different mindset, yeah. you know, yeah. and Barry Sugar Hill Records, um, which has now been bought and bought and bought. So it's part of the Concord group, I think. But back then, Sugar Hill Records was an independent label owned by this one person who had great taste in music. And he did, you know, folk music and Americana music and, and stuff that has an audience, but not the big mainstream audience like country music or pop music. Um, and so Barry knew what to do with Guy. And at the same time, um, Americana music got its own radio chart and, an, and a trade organization started around it. And so now there was a place for Guy. Yeah. Um, so that change in the business really sure. helped. So in my mind, Guy did make it and he has a lot of fans, you know, hundreds of thousands of fans. He's That's just true. not, he's just not Justin Timberlake, you know, yeah. he's not that mainstream. He's a niche yeah. person, you know. Um, but he, he understood that he had to, um, uh, he had to find a way to work within the music industry, you know, he, he, sure. and he found his place and he was very serious about it. Mm -hmm. You know, he cared about his publishing deal and he cared about commitments and, and being a grown up when it came to, you know, working within the industry, even if, you know, like he, he didn't, he was, he had his artistic integrity. He wouldn't, you know, try too too hard to write the next Garth Brooks uh, single, but he would uh, be an adult when it came to working in the industry. And he he uh, felt that Susanna and Towns didn't necessarily have that same uh, adult uh, view of the music industry. You know, they were more of just like having fun and whatever happens happens. But he really took it seriously all the way through his whole career he was very much professional about his work and the reason he yeah. lived in nashville is because this is where the publishing business is yeah. and he always wanted to go back to texas but felt that he couldn't because he needed to live in the same town as his publisher and that might have been true for most of his career because we didn't have you know the sure. internet communication the way we do now and he turned in his songs and he you know he had a booking agent and he had you know an uh, business accounting people and he showed up for interviews and he always, you know, he did all the, the work side of it. Um, 
and and took it very seriously. And you know, his calendars, he he planned. You know, he had calendars and he planned ahead of when he was going to write, <laughs> wow. when he was going to handle business. And wow. so I think that kind of surprises some people that he did take Absolutely. the part seriously. Yeah. yeah, at least planning out like writing and stuff like that. Um, you just have this like romanticized idea of songwriters on a peak of a mountain somewhere with a campfire, writing every song that way. You yeah. Know? And that's well, not the reality of that. it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it becomes, it, you know, I guess to some extent I've interviewed a lot of musicians. It just becomes not a job, but I guess they say they just have to like, like a workout. Like I have to, you know, sort of schedule it in that I'm going to wake up and sit down and write at, for, you know, from this time to this time and, and do something, you know, productive or whatever. I don't know. I guess everybody's different. You know, writing is hard and, and guy, you know, he would always say that he'd record an album when he had 10 great songs, but it took him years to get 10 great songs for an album, you know, because it's, and every day that he was home in Nashville, when he was not on the road, he wrote, you know, he scheduled those co-writes or he wrote by himself or whatever um, every day. And that's what, you know, any writer will tell you if they're serious about a project or serious about something you have to, you have to write, you have to sit your butt in the chair and write and it's hard. And, and he liked um, hearing what other people had written. He always wanted to hear, uh, oh, wow. your most recent song or what you were excited about, you know, he was always asking, uh, of the people, the songwriter and musician friends that came to his house, you know, what, what do you got? What's your newest yeah. song? He always wanted to hear somebody's newest song. And, uh, That's great. He, he wouldn't, um, uh, you know, he wouldn't just blow smoke at people about, well, he literally would blow smoke in your face from his, <laughs> your back, but, uh, he, <laughs> figuratively figuratively, yeah. <laughs> figuratively. <laughs> no yes. literally he did but <laughs> yeah That's i mean funny. even even toward the end of his life when he was in so much pain and suffering you know someone would come over to see him at the nursing home or whatever and and he would say do you have a new song you know what's your new song i mean he it it, it was really important to him to hear other people's work which I always really admired that he cared so much about what other people were doing artistically. I once had a conversation with Guy for more than an hour when I was supposed to be interviewing him and he was interviewing me about ghostwriting. <laughs> how we did that and how it worked and, you know, and... Uh, He's he, inquisitive. He's curious, right? Um, very much. You know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, in, that's a part of songwriting, I think. Um, you're curious about something and you want to spread a message i mean i'm sure there's lots of different ways um i wonder how many guy clark songs never no one's ever heard i mean i wonder what percentage hundreds. of songs he wrote did it make, you know what i mean oh man yeah there's there's many hundreds that have not wow. been heard yet i think maybe someday they will but wow yeah wow wow, wow. well he would yeah. find an idea if he heard an idea that he thought would make a good song you know he would write it down and then he might go back and work on it a little bit and then put it away for a while. And then uh, something would remind him of that idea. It's like, oh, I, I had a song that was sort of based on that idea. Let me go look. And then sometimes he would steal or, you know, repurpose stuff that he had written and never finished it, repurpose it into a newer idea of a song. So there's all kinds of, you know, work bits and pieces out there. I, you know, who knows? I don't know that it's cataloged in any way, but he did keep a lot of notebooks full of. Uh, oh my of gosh! Ideas I bet. I bet. Oh my goodness! Absolutely, just stuff that. Yeah, just letting it go. I mean, he he mentions in the film, right? If you if you have an idea or something, write it down quickly because you're going to forget more than likely, mm -hmm. um, and that way you can come back to it later. Which is interesting because a lot of different songwriters have different methods. I mean, I know songwriters that. That what they just they just sit they like they sit down with the idea and write it and then they're done with it like that's that's it they don't really they're not writing song over six month time or two years or right. I'm gonna come back to this right. idea and this that yeah they don't but other people are and some people do I don't know it's just this um I guess that's the beauty of it uh, yeah you right just have on. your personal way of working you know yeah. well, I'm really slow in everything I do so my projects always take a long time. We heard the story from multiple different people where they would uh, come to Guy just on a social visit or 
or run into him somewhere and they would they would mention some bit of uh news that happened in their life you know some some something that happened and guy would say we should write a song about it (laughs) i love that so that we heard that from so many different people I yeah, I mean, that's how the whole Sis Draper series came to be. Sis Draper and Magnolia Wynn and Soldier's Joy. And there's like, I think there's eight songs that Guy wrote with Sean Camp. And Sean was just telling Guy a story about this woman he knew named Sis Draper. And now it's a whole series of songs. And Ashley Monroe was over there and Guy said, tell me about your life. And she was told him some story and then she said, and yeah, here I am. I came out smelling like a rose. And he said, well, there's the song. And they wrote like a rose together, you know, just wow. that kind of stuff happened a lot with guy. Oh, that's amazing. It's, you know, it, again, it's the stories behind these songs. It's the stories behind the music um, that separate, I think a lot of artists um, because some artists just aren't like that, right? You hear a song, it's done. There's not really much to it. Um, you were to tell somebody how this came together uh whatever um but uh it is amazing that that's why singer songwriters i think stand out more than anything they're they're going to put a lot more effort into that song you're hearing well and that's uh, that's i think a difference between somebody that's a songwriter that's only writing songs for other singers and someone who's a singer songwriter who's going to perform the material by themselves yeah. you know in front of an audience i think it is a different mindset yeah um yeah. Absolutely. And they're both valid ways to, you know, approach it. Um, just different music, and, you know? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Guy always said that uh, a song wasn't finished until you performed it before an audience. That was when it was done. So I like yeah, that. For him, that was a very important part of the songwriting process was to perform it to an audience just to have finished writing it. It, it wasn't done yet. Yeah, you had to hear how the audience reacted to it and if there was that connection. And That's interesting. Yeah. So I wonder if he's shelved songs that he played once and just was like, nope, that's never going to see the light of day again. Yeah, he has. You know, wow, yeah. that's interesting. Or, or if somebody else did a better version of it. He'd quit playing it. Like when Sean did, you know, Sis Draper and Magnolia Wynn, when he recorded those, Guy said, well, I'm never performing those again because Sean... <laughs> Oh man. Sean did it like better, you know. Pass the torch, uh, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's uh it just sounds like he's very respectful of the art and you know th- that's I, I enough. That's it. That's it in yeah. a nutshell. Yeah, he, um, he he's very respectful of the art and of artists, you know. Yeah. And guy is um this kind of just popped in my head. I haven't really thought about it before, but Guy was the first person who reminded me that I was an artist. You know, I always thought of myself as just, oh, I write and I do this, but it never, I never thought of it as, you know, art. It's just these oh, projects yeah. I do. And most and certainly Guy, is. Yeah. Guy one day, you know, I don't remember exactly what he said, but I remember he said, well, you know, you as an artist. And I was thinking, oh, wow. You know, I never thought of myself as an artist, but, um, you know, when you create something, you're an artist. Absolutely. Yeah, there's all kinds of art. Um, that's the biggest argument. Too. That's the biggest question, right? What is art and what, what can be defined as art? Um, not to say yours is in the outskirts because yours is very much uh, art, uh, for sure. I, 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 that never crossed my mind that you weren't, uh, to be honest with you, in my, in my head. So, uh, yeah, but that's funny that that's where your mind's at yeah. your, well, yourself. Um, you know, as writers, uh, you know, now at my age, I have a lot of young writers that, that ask me for advice and they'll say, well, how do I become a writer? And I say, you write, you write <laughs> you're a writer, you know, whether you're being paid for it, whether you're professional, whatever, yeah. but it, how do you become a writer is you just start writing and now you are a writer. And I think it's the same thing with art. If you're creating something, you are now an artist, whether, whether you're doing it as a hobby, whether you're trying to do it commercially, you are in the act of doing it. It makes you that. Um, and the act of doing it is the hard part. Absolutely. It's not the idea, right? The, those are dime a dozen. It's the execution of the idea. Execution that's... is the hard part. Is, yeah, that's where the that's where the uh, the billion dollar stock uh, IPO is, right? If you've got a company <laughs> or something, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Were there any um, questions 
so we sort of my way to wrap this up here a little bit i think this would be a good way to 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 you know tail in this um were there any questions that you didn't get any answers to from doing this do you feel like there's anything like unanswered about i don't know any questions you might have had or going into this or you know we just didn't get to this or whatever i know you mentioned we could have made you know countless films so of course well, why didn't you add this or that but i mean just personally from y'all's point of view well for me you know i did not know towns and everything i know about towns i learned from guy or susanna or what other people have written about him and if i could you know have a magic wand it would have been nice to actually personally get into towns brain a little bit but that just yeah. wasn't a possibility so we had to do the best we could but i think that's the only for me the only thing i wish yeah we yeah. would have been able to do yeah well i never met susanna in person you know i feel like i know her because yeah. i've spent so much time listening to her voice on a tape recorder and you know hearing of different people tell the same story from different points of view. So, but I, I have no firsthand experience with her. So I, you know, I don't know that I honestly truly have who she is, you know, because there did seem to be a little bit of performance even on her, her uh, diary uh, re recordings, you know, there was a, a bit of like, you know, I'm not sure if that was, uh, if I really got who she was. And oh, I did know Susanna for 12 years, but I knew the Susanna after Towns died when yeah. she took to her bed. So I did not know the same Susanna, even though I knew her for many years, I did not know the same Susanna that Rodney and Steve and, and those guys. Sure. Knew. I wish that I had known all of them back, back when they then. were younger. You know, I wish I could have hung out with them back when they were all young and crazy. It sounds like it would have been a lot of fun, you know. <laughs> absolutely. I, you know, I just met Guy when he was, you know, much older. Yeah, absolutely. No, that is interesting. Um, I guess there's a little bit of mystery, but in 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 some ways, that's kind of a good thing, maybe a little bit, right? To to it all. Um, yeah. Yeah, it well, helps helps the myth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, there's always going to be things you don't know, right? Uh, to, to some extent, um, for sure. Um, it's got to be so difficult to have your life, you know, people looking into your life. I, I don't know if I would want that for myself. How did, I, guy, I how did guy feel about, how did guy feel about that? Like he was, was he, he was very much, uh, into it. Mm -hmm. He was, he, he, you know, if he, if he had any, uh, Wow. any hesitation i never saw it he was always just very open you know come into the house literally and and you know we i thought about that song step inside this house because he was it was like come in and look around yeah. look everywhere you know uh, he he wanted his story to be uh recorded and told and he wow. didn't hesitate at, at all ever it, you know, when I started working on the book, I, I had already known Guy for 10 years before we started working on the book. And so I thought there's no way he's going to go down this deep hole with me. And it was so surprising that he did. And, and if I wouldn't show up at the house for a couple of days, he'd call me and say, where are you? Get over here. We have work to do. <laughs> and he would say, I mean, I went through every drawer in the house. He would say, go empty out that drawer and see what's in it. Go look wow. under the bed. Look, you know, he was wide open with his things, his archives, and also with his brain and his heart, you know, he just gave everything to this yeah. project and it does make me sad that he died before the book came out a few months before the book came out he never got to see the film you know he yeah. did hear the tribute album that we did which at least i feel like he got a little bit of a gift from us before he went but sure um but i would when we would go to this house you know i'd thank him for letting us uh interrupt his day and you know monopolize his time and he was always like no please do please interrupt my day come whenever you want you know so he he enjoyed it yeah That's we amazing. had we had a lot of fun with guy working on this we did in the in the time that we had with him 
That's amazing. He's in the, his like, I want to tell stories. I want to front front porch guy Clark. Right. Yeah. 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 I love it. That's wow. Well, that's amazing. Um, well, they're all dearly missed. It's a wonderful film. Y'all, y'all made a great tribute to them and showing their life and um, really diving deep into just different aspects of their sort of dynamic and um, just find out a lot about them. And yeah, it's a great, great film. Y'all really did a great job piecing this Thank together. You. Yeah, Thank I really th thoroughly enjoyed it. And I watch a lot of documentaries, right? That's like the hot thing that people watch now, right? Like that's like- I hope so. <laughs> I, it is it is for sure and you know i've been telling everyone to go see this film since i've seen it uh for sure and we're going to be pushing it for sure and um who you. doesn't who doesn't uh, you know who's not a guy clark fan at least that i know at least I, look i'm a little biased i'm in texas you're gonna you're gonna run into a lot of them here um, where so, in texas are you i'm in dallas uh right now but i i've just moved here from i was in austin for seven years okay. right before this uh just a few months uh ago so um he's big in austin for sure um dallas i don't know i guess really he played, to be he played honest. dallas a lot guy played dallas a lot he played the kessler he played poor david's pub and he has a big audience in dallas oh really poor david's pub i live right i could throw a rock to poor david's pub right out my window yep. over here he played um, there a lot yeah. Wow. Okay. Wow. That's amazing. Wow. That's great. I walk my dogs by there every day. Now I'm going to be looking at it way differently now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's amazing. That's cool. Well, thank you all so much for your time. I uh, really do appreciate it. We're going to put a link in the, um, the description um, for, for seeing the film. It's um, I'll say it one more time here real quick. Uh, Without getting killed or caught um, dot com. You can rent it for one day or three days. It's a great film uh, to watch with the family, yourself, your friends, share it let's spread the word right uh let's get this film out Thank there and you. get people to probably see probably not so. young kids though there's a lot of cussing <laughs> that's true well i don't know you know who knows uh, everyone's different with their kids but yes you're right you're right uh 100 i don't have kids see i don't that's not my where my head goes uh my nephews you're right i wouldn't want my nephews to see that just yet uh so yes <laughs> unless they are yeah. really familiar with the f word already <laughs> i i would be a horrible parent y'all listen i would be a horrible parent uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> thank y'all so much. I, again, I really do appreciate the time. This is amazing um, insight into uh, the you. film. Hopefully it'll get people excited uh, to go watch it. Thank you. It was fun, fun to do this with you. Thanks. Awesome. Thank y'all so much. The Lone Star Play podcast is produced by Texas Real Food. Go to texasrealfood.com and you can search your city for stores, butchers, restaurants, farmers markets, and more who are using fresh, artisanal, organic sources. It's a fun site that brings all natural options all together. I hope you enjoyed this episode. For more information, go to thelonestarplay.com. I'm your host, Patrick Scott Armstrong. Until next time.